Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you are doing for us. Thank you so much for giving us sunshine, for giving us a roof over our heads, for giving us power, Lord. Um, Thank you that the only winds we deal with today will be the west winds from Monterey Bay and not the hurricanes and stuff we had yesterday. Thank you for your presence because that is the most important thing. And we invite you to stay with us um, even longer into this program. Bless us as we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, it always brings back memories um, of my childhood when my dad sings because for me, uh, a lot of times my first, you know, outside of eating snacks, right, like animal crackers in the back pews at church, my earliest memories of church are actually going around with my dad uh, and singing at, at various churches in our area. And so it always reminds me of, kind of brings me back to when I was a kid. And this might sound silly, but the older I get, uh, the more I like looking back um, when the most serious thing was, is church going to end on time? Uh, you know, now obviously life is, is much more complicated. I know some of you, that is the most serious thing on your mind right now, is church going to end on time? But I know that as I get older, going back to the simplicity of my childhood um, is, you know, it's, it's, it's something that I do more often. And I know some of you are like, well, I would like to go back to when I was 27. Um, and one day... One day we will all go back to the joys of, of whatever we've been missing. But until that day, we are here. And when I think about growing up, the one thing that I enjoyed as a kid, I was that, that child that I was the know-it-all. Uh, still am, I guess, a little bit. But I was that kid that was like, I know my memory verse. And they're like, that's okay, you've said it twice already. We need somebody else to say it. But I know my memory verse, right? And I had to know how things work, and I did things. And what happened was I loved knowing stuff. I know a lot of random stuff that is absolutely no use to me in daily life, but I had to know it. And so out of that grew this desire to know how things work, And so I always loved the idea of, you know, building things and creating things and and seeing how they work. And, you know, I was that kid that I would read biology textbooks, um, I guess for fun, because I wanted to know how certain things led to other certain things and and, and whatnot. And, you know, I, I first started seeing it with things like Lego, you know, can you build something that will work, right? As soon as I saved up the money to buy it off my older brother, you know, I'd play with the Legos. Um, I started realizing that most toys, children's toys, are not really designed to be taken apart and then put back together. And so it got me into a lot of trouble trying to figure out, well, how does this arm hinge work and why does it connect and stuff? I mean, I remember my parents got me a, actually, no, I think it was, it was my aunties. They brought me like this, this plastic engine that had an ignition and it had spark plugs and all these things. And it's funny because we were never allowed to play with it because if we took it apart, we could never put it back together. My mom would be walking and she would step on a part. And then all of a sudden, no matter where we were in the house, we could hear our names. And you know, it was kind of like the Garden of Eden where we hear our names being called and we ran. Um, But I grew up and I loved understanding how do things work? How does putting this together change this? How does it how does it affect? And probably if I hadn't gone into ministry, if I hadn't felt this call to be a pastor, I, I would have loved to have gone into something like mechanical engineering or something like that. Understanding, you know, how things work, how you can create and do this stuff. And so in order to scratch that itch, I guess, because obviously my work is not, you know, it's more figuring out how people work, I guess, um, than, than machines. In order to do that, a couple years ago, I, uh, I bought a really old well, not really old, but I bought an old car. And I decided that I was gonna you know, spend a little bit of money buying this car and I was gonna fix it up and I was gonna learn how it worked and take it apart and try and do these things. And so uh, two summers ago, I bought a 1990 Mazda Miata. So it was a little red. It wasn't really red anymore. It was kind of pinkish mixed with like orange because rust is orange. Um, and it was, in, it was in bad shape. And I didn't care because I was like, you know what, I'm gonna try and fix it. I'm gonna try and do these things anyway. And unfortunately, I completely underestimated how bad of shape it was. And like a couple weeks ago, I actually sold it for parts to save up money to buy a different car to try and fix that one up. Surprise, Pastor God, so we haven't had this conversation yet. Um, But (laughs) you learn a lot when you try and fix things. Um, And so... You know, you see the title is The Mechanic, and and we're talking about this idea of organizing for service. 
And one of the things I learned right off the bat is if, in order for me to service my car, it was a lot better if my workspace was organized. Get it? And organized for service, right? And so all three of my brothers, well, all three of us, so I have an older brother, I have a younger brother, and myself, we're all into cars. It all started with my older brother. Um, he had a car when we were like 10, and we were like, oh my goodness, and had like flashing lights, and had like stickers and everything. We're like, this is so cool. And so we all got into cars. So we all eventually started learning how to work on cars, and I'm the last one to that party. And so because we don't have a lot of space, the garage at my house, which used to be my brother's house, and before that, my other brother's house, um, is the place we work on our cars. And the thing is, though, we are not the most organized when we work on our cars. And so, point being, my brother will come in, my older brother, and he'll do brakes on his car, or he'll do suspension, or he'll do something, and he'll use some tools, and he'll put them back where he wants to put them. And then my younger brother will come in and he had a friend over and he was, he was pulling out a motor and putting in a new motor and they used tools and they put the tools where they wanted them. And then just last week, I decided I was going to change the, the cabin air filter on my car, which is a big piece that goes across the entire uh, front of the dash under the hood. It takes roughly like five minutes to change. It's eight bolts. You undo the bolts, you pop the cover off, take, unclip the filter, put the new filter in, put it on. The problem is, it took way longer than that because I couldn't find the socket that I needed to fix that. And one of the very simple things for that is, I've noticed that it's amazing that the thing you need at that moment, you could have seen it last week, you could have seen it yesterday, you could have seen it 10 minutes ago, but as soon as you need it, if you're not organized, it's never there. It's amazing how this little inanimate piece of metal can get up and fly away. And I found that, so what I've been doing now is trying to clean it because just like many of you, there's no car that actually stays in my garage, right? It's the old supplies from a renovation. It's, you know, the sink that you replaced. It's someone's clothes from 20 years ago. I don't even know whose clothes they are. They're just there. Um, and so I've been going through trying to organize and in doing so, in trying to be a mechanic for my car, and we're going to talk about a little bit more lessons that I've learned through that, but in trying to do that, I have realized that in order to get the job done, in order to service my car and be successful, it needs to start by being organized. And this, this applies to so many things, but it also applies to the church. And so I, I want to start in the, I guess, in, in the section of the book that, I, that I'm... I guess, focusing on. And that's like page 72 to 110. And and it's a lot of different quotes about organization. And so I wanted to start with two. And the first one is from the Review and Herald, September 29, 1891. And it says this, let there be in every church well-organized companies of workers to labor in the vicinity of that church. The General Conference Bulletin, 1893, page 37 says, in every city, there should be a core of organized, well-disciplined workers, not merely one or two, but scores should be set to work. And so the thing is, is that we have a very big task put in front of us, right? We have a very big mission. If you think about the church, we don't talk about the church service or the church building, um, but the church is that body of Christ, right, that we read in our scripture reading. It's that group of people that have been called together to do something for the Lord, And when you look at the first group that was called together, all the way back in Genesis, Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abram and he says, Abram, you know, leave leave where you are right now and I want you to go to a place that I tell you. And then he goes on and to say, I will, you know, I will make you a great nation and I will bless those who bless you. Uh, Verse three, and I will curse those who curse you. And through you, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. God does not call a group of people together to be stagnant. He calls a group of people back then and then after, obviously after his resurrection under the new covenant, he calls that group of people, us. He calls us together so that we can bless the world. He calls us to service. And the thing that I learned from my little experiment with my, with my rusty old car 
is that service is hard when you're not organized. And so I want to look at a, at a couple examples, the first one in the Old Testament and the second one touching on the New Testament. And so Numbers 11. So you're going to go to the book of Numbers, chapter 11, and we're looking at Moses. All right, so chapter 11 and verse 16. While you're looking for that, some background. Obviously, Moses has taken his people out of Egypt, right? Moses is this leader appointed by God, but he is a leader over millions of of people. And what I've found in my own experience, and Moses could have a different personality than me, is I, I guess you could say I struggle with people. I'm a little bit more introverted, um, and so anytime I'm in big crowds or whatever, it really wears me out. Anytime I deal with big groups of people, it, it really wears me out. Even after a sermon sometimes, it's like, oh. And so what happens is, for him, is Moses is starting to get worn out. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One, there's just so many people to take care of. Two, this is a group of people who have spent their entire existence in slavery and they've, they've always been looking to someone to make decisions for them. Now they have power and so they're trying to all make their own decisions. They're fighting with each other, right? And when they're fighting with each other and stuff doesn't go right, they're complaining to Moses, right? Have you ever dealt with someone that is constantly complaining to you? How does that affect you eventually? It can wear you out, right? And on top of that, not only just his own people, but there's a bunch of Egyptians that saw what was happening in Egypt. They're like, we're leaving with them. But the problem is, they're now in the wilderness and they're like, man, you know, hey, let's go back to Egypt, right? Because they weren't really trying to get out of Egypt. They just wanted to avoid the punishment. And so now Moses is here and he's being worn out and his father-in-law Jethro is telling him, you know, maybe you should get some help. And so he goes to the Lord and he talks about it and this is what the Lord says. Numbers 11, verse 16 to 17. The Lord answered Moses, Bring me 70 men from Israel, known to you as elders and officers of the people. Take them to the tent of meeting and have them stand there with you. Then I will come down and speak with you there. I will take some of the spirit who is on you and put the spirit on them. They will help you bear the burden of the people so that you do not have to bear it by yourself. And there's a couple things that stand out to me from this. The first one is, is that he says, I will take some of the spirit that I gave to you and I will give it to them. See, Moses was like, man, I can't do this. It's so hard to lead. But you know what God was saying? He's like, all of this ability and spirit that I'm going to give to them, you already had. And sometimes we get in this idea that, you know, I can't do it, I can't do it. God has already equipped you to do it. He didn't say, okay, you don't have enough. I'll go get some more spirit and share it with these guys. He takes it from Moses and shares it. So sometimes when, when we're in leadership, right, organization, if you're in leadership, you feel like, man, you know, I can't do this. I, I need this help. I need help. Your help is from God. Okay, I want to encourage you for that because sometimes I've been in leadership. I have planned things that no one shows up to, no one wants to be a part of, and I've still seen God work amazing things. Because it's not about us. It's not about our abilities. But the second thing is, he had enough to give to Moses. But God didn't really need Moses. Right? God could show up and lead them by himself. He could do, you know, he already had the pillar of cloud there. It, wasn't, it wouldn't be too hard to turn that pillar, you know, make it look like a person and start pointing directions. Right? God could have done that. But the amazing thing about this is, is that God doesn't want to work by himself. The whole purpose that he created us was for us to be with him, to be alongside of him. And so even in the work, God has said, you know what? I want to involve my people. Okay, it's just Moses. Now there's 70 more people. And those 70 will reach out to somebody else. And they will reach out to somebody else. And all of a sudden, millions of people are in contact with what God is wanting for them. And they are organized and they can move forward. Now we know that not everyone got with the program and, and the whole wandering in the wilderness thing, that was problematic. But the idea is that God puts these things in place not just because, you know, he needs organization, he needs to share the load, but God creates these organizations, he creates these things in order for more and more people to enjoy, right, to experience the blessing of working with him. If you're asked to do something, it's not, you know, out of an obligation or something, it's because God knows and the leaders know that by serving God, there is a joy in there that you don't get somewhere else. And so he uses that. And Jesus even realized it. Because here's the thing. You can have a great leader. 
You can have a great leader, but the problem is you can have a great pastor, you can have a great whatever, but the, the problem is is that they are still limited, right? They're still limited. Um, I am not perfect. I'm not a perfect person, not a perfect pastor. I don't have unlimited energy. I actually get sleepy very, very easily. Um, it's problematic because, uh, you know, the last thing you want is when someone else is preaching for the pastor to be like, you know, you got halfway through, you're like, amen, you know, something like that. But I'm limited, and I'm limited by a physical spot. And even Jesus understood this because in John 16, right, in John 16, he says, he's talking to his disciples, and he's saying, I'm about to leave you, right? I gotta, I'm gonna go back to the Father. And they're like, no, Jesus, don't leave, which is natural, right? We wouldn't have wanted him to leave either. But this is how he responds. John chapter 16, verse seven. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus could do amazing things. But one of the things that Jesus did not do is be in multiple places at the same time. And he realized that it was better for the Holy Spirit to be here that could spread out than for him just to stay in bodily form. And sometimes, you know, we look at it as, you know, this ministry leader or the pastor or this or that, but we're limited by geography, we're limited by sin, we're limited by all these things. And when everyone steps out, when everyone gets on board, and when you can organize and do that thing so everyone has, has a part to play, what happens is you reach way more people. There are people that I can talk to and I can start the, if I start the conversation by saying, hey, you know, I'm the pastor of Willowdale Church, that a wall might come up. But you know what? There could be somebody else that can talk to them and they will listen. That's why God made us different. That's why God made so many of us, right? Because each one of us might have access and influence to someone completely different. And so our our organization cannot be, we're going to have one person do this, and they're going to handle everything. The organization becomes, you know what? I am gifted in this area. I have connection and influence in this area, and so I will do this while you do this and we do this. And you know what happens? We get everything done. The reason many hands make light work as a statement is because it has been proven over and over and over again. And it's evidenced again in the, I was going to say the Second Testament, the New Testament. Because when you look at the book of Acts, you know, it's really easy to organize when it's small. Right? When the disciples were just the 12 of them, actually, if we're going to be honest, it was hard for them to organize when there were just 12 of them because the whole, you know, personality thing. But we'll get to that later. But all of a sudden, Peter starts preaching after Pentecost, and now there's 3,000 more people in their church, right? They went from that one room worshiping together, so now there's 3,000 people. And it says now, day after day, they're adding and adding and adding. And what happens is, if you don't pay attention to it, and you're not organized and ready for this growth, people people fall through the cracks. And so you have in in Acts chapter, leading up to Acts chapter 6, this idea that, that there are widows and people that are being forgotten, We're growing so fast that we're being forgotten. And so, you know, in 1 verse 7, they choose the deacons and they start figuring out ways to do that. And I've said it before and I'll just say it one more time. One of the keys to our success is going to be organizing. Because if we grow as a church, right, we want to do evangelism, we want to bring people in, but if we, have, we, if we don't have anything set up for when they come in, people fall through the cracks. People start saying that our church doesn't care about them. And then all of a sudden, when we tell them we want to change your life because we care about you, they've heard it from all these other people saying, you know what, no, they don't. And so sometimes we think, you know, I'll organize, well, you know, we'll get ready, and we'll do this, and, and we'll figure it out, you know, when the Sunday law comes, or when this happens. But I want you to read what it says in Testimonies to the Church, Volume 1, page 261. Ellen White is is writing and she says, I was shown God's people waiting for some change to take place, a compelling power to take hold of them. But they will be disappointed, for they are wrong. They must act. They must take hold of the work themselves and earnestly cry to God for a true knowledge of the work themselves. The scenes which are passing before us, like the things that are happening around us, are enough magnitude to cause us to awake and to urge the truth home to the hearts of all who listen. The harvest of the earth is nearly ripe. Ripe, nearly ripe. Some of us have waited a very long time 
to get involved. And the thing is, is I can talk about organization all day. But if there's no one to organize, it's very hard to get anything done. And I know that there are ministry leaders, and I thank the Lord for you, who are, dealing, who are just being like, help. If someone could just show up. If there's this, I know there's young people that want to be involved and they're not sure, and they think, oh, everyone thinks I'm too young. No, you're not too young. I guarantee you, if you went up to a ministry leader and like, what can I do to help you? That they would be like, oh, praise the Lord. Each and every one of you are valuable. Each and every one of you have a gift that someone else might not. And part of that is, is figuring out what it is. But we've done spiritual gift inventories. We've done these things as, as churches and stuff like that. At some point, in order to organize, you have to have something to organize. And so I encourage you, if you haven't gotten involved, please get involved. Because it is extremely important. 2 Timothy 2, verse 1 to 7. Then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Right, even at the beginning of that, it says, listen, you've learned something, I have been with you, but what, I, what you need to do is it can't just stay with you. Now entrust it to other people. And those people will teach and they will learn and they will trust it to other people. And the idea is, is that our reach and our network of influence will be constantly growing constantly expanding because what happens is we take that top-down approach where it's come to God, it's come to us, and then it goes out. And so it continues on. Verse three, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer that ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. And I want to just focus on these, kind of these parables. I love how the Bible can give kind of these real-life examples. And so the first one, you look at a soldier, right? The purpose of a soldier, in many situations, is to win battles. For protection of the country, for expansion, you know, it's a lot of different things, but it's to win battles. And it's interesting, it says, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits. The thing that's interesting about an army is if you look at all of the great military battles, and I'm not trying to glorify fighting, but if you look at them, the ones who win are the ones who are better organized, had a better plan, and stuck to the strategy. And the ones that lose, many times are the ones that are caught unaware. They're not ready, or, you know, they're woefully underprepared. And it's a big deal. I, I am naive about it. I've never had to live through a war, I'll be honest. But I, can, I don't need to live through it to know that a war is a big deal. And I can tell you right now that the war in heaven, this great controversy, is a much bigger deal sometimes than we give it credit. And we are the army of God. We are the soldiers of God. Now, with the athlete, I have a little bit more, I guess you could say, experience with that. This is my sixth year coaching high school basketball, and I've coached a team for a long time, seen a lot of players come through my system, you know, been to tournaments, been, you know, done all those things, and it, it's always interesting, right? An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. When you look at a team sport, right, when you look at a team sport, you do not win, whether you're playing football, American football, you know, I'm trying to think of other sports, cricket, volleyball, right, because we have the volleyball game tonight, 8.30, um, basketball or any of those things, usually the better prepared, better organized team with the better plan wins. And we can train and we can do all sorts of things, but because no team sport can be carried exactly by one person, everyone has to be a part of it. And I remember the point for this is it doesn't matter how skilled you are. Um, one of my third year coaching, so four years ago, roughly. I'm not good at math. Um, I was teaching one of my, my centers, very tall young man. Um, even as a 14-year-old, he towered over me. Um, and he was learning, and I taught him. I said, you know what? When you're rebounding, and when we're trying to score, you know, in the post and stuff, you know, you rebound, you get that ball, and you don't bring it down. That's one of the first rules. If you are a tall person playing basketball, the minute you bring the ball down, all the little people like me can now reach it. If you keep it high, we, we just have to look at you. 
And so I was trying to tell him, you are bigger than everybody else. And so we learned that, and he would practice, and he would practice. And so what happened is one day we were there, and we were trying to get into our play, right, the organized part of our game. And what happened was the other team decided to press. They caught us off guard. We didn't have anything set up for a press. We didn't have much practice time during the week. And so what happened was everyone's being, you know, covered. And so he decided to come down, and he ran, you know, and I was like, yes, this is good. He's learning. And he ran to go take the inbound. And my player, who had been really stressed, saw him. And he was like, oh, okay. And he passed him the ball. And he took the ball, and he, and he held it, and he chinned the ball. He kept it high, just like I had taught him just so many times he had done in drills. And he never brought it down, but just went straight back up, put it softly off the glass. This was back before he could dunk. And he just, he just you know, softly off the glass and in the basket. And he turned and he looked at me to, you know, to, to impress his coach, and he just saw me standing by the scorer's table like this because that was our net. It didn't matter how good he did it. It didn't matter how skilled he was. The problem was he was going the wrong direction. He wasn't following the plan. He was unorganized. What had happened was, and I didn't know this, is that during halftime in basketball, your directions switch. But he had gone to the bathroom. And so when he came back in, it was really close to the thing. And so I said, I'm like, hey, you know what? Uh, guy's getting in foul trouble. He was a freshman. I'm like, go shine, young man. Oh, he shone. We lost by two points. <laughs> it was rough. And I've seen that over and over again, that this idea, it doesn't matter how skilled you are, but when you are unorganized, you will always lose to the more organized team. The thing with the great controversy is that we are, we are a team facing someone that has had 6,000 years to prep for us. And he is organized. And he has this and that. And he knows our weaknesses. And if we don't, if we're not organized and cohesive and, and working together, what happens is we lose that game. And obviously this is much more serious than a game. Right? Because it's that, because we're really not just athletes, we're soldiers. And so the thing is, you have to organize, you have to have this strong thing. And I'm not here to say kind of how to organize because, quite frankly, um, I'm pretty impressed with a lot of the organization that we have. There's things in place. What it needs is, you know, I guess you could say bodies. There's even money. Like, I look, I'm like, there's even money to do stuff. Uh, and the organization is there. We just got to get into it. Here's the other thing about a soldier and an athlete, right? They do not wait until the battle starts or until the game starts to start practicing, right? Many of us um, can look back on what we would consider our glory days athletically, right? I am, I'm realizing my window to create some is, very, is closing very rapidly. But many of us looked at, you know, I used to be able to do this or that, and, you know, you sit around and you tell the stories. And I remember for me, I did gymnastics a lot. Right, so in, in high school, all four years of university, um, you know, flipping and all that type of stuff. But it, it had been a while, right? It had been a while, and this past Saturday night, I was over at Kingsway because they were having the Ariel's Home Show, and like Lara and Rainer and Bria were on the team, and so, you know, I was going to support them. And someone called me out. Someone like, because I, I ended up doing like a little thing that had nothing to do with gymnastics. And like, oh, it's so nice that you can still be involved since you can't do anything anymore. And I was standing there, and I was like, oh, I'm sorry, are you, are you talking, me? I'm like, oh, I can do stuff. Like, we've never seen you. And I was like, hold my jacket. And I handed my jacket to someone, and I went there. And, you know, in my mind, I'm like, it's been like a year and a half since I've done anything. But, in, but the other side of my mind is like, you'll be okay. The ground is soft. And I was like, okay. And I went and I did a backflip. And it was a pretty impressive backflip. I was pretty happy with myself. But what I noticed is the next day, and the next two days after that, my stomach felt like, like someone had, had like, kind of like ripped it apart. And I noticed like my right Achilles was like really painful. And I noticed like my shoulder was kind of sore. I did one backflip. But because I hadn't been keeping up with it, even though I kind of made it around, my body was broken. And 
Luckily, I landed on my feet, because I remember after high school, I took a break, and I went back, and I'm all confident in myself, and I saw Matt, and I went, and I did like a little round-off cartwheel thing, and I went to do my backflip, and partway through the backflip, I'm like, so what happens now? And the thing is, that's not the time to think it through. Because I started thinking to myself, and I'm like, well, like, what happens now? Well, eventually I'm supposed to pull on my legs, and halfway through that sentence, I just landed on my head. And sometimes we get this idea that we can just do it, because we did it before. And what's even more, da that's dangerous, what's even more dangerous is we've never done it at all, but we're like, but yeah, when they put a gun in my face, yeah, I'm going to stand up for Jesus. We're going to know exactly how to reach out when an emergency happens, Right? And sometimes I've seen, sometimes we scramble in these situations because we're not organized, we're not prepared. Preparation is super important. But what happens is, just like many times in other areas of life, we have spiritual procrastination. Right? Um, a lot of people had a lot of issues because there was no Wi-Fi last night. And so I even talked to someone, I'm not going to call any names, that was, that was going to prep for Sabbath school but could not get the lesson because there was no power. There was power earlier on Friday and earlier in the week and all of those things, and it's happened to me all the time. But spiritually what happens is we're not organized. We think, oh, I'll do it later. I'll prep it later. We don't know when later is. Those 10 people when they were walking down Young Street, we don't know what they had put off to later, but later never came. And as a church, it might not even be that, that our church ceased to function or, or we, we're destroyed or something, but there might be an opportunity, a chance that shows up right now. And because we were waiting for later, we missed it. God has called us to bless the world in the here and now. And so I want to continue, go back to the idea of me and my car, right? What I learned trying to be a mechanic, well, the first thing I learned is find someone that's actually a mechanic. But <laughs> Romans 12, verse 4 to 5, it's our scripture reading. And it says this, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Right? The thing with the, with the body is it only works if it has body parts. The thing with my car is that it only worked, you know, if it had wheels. And that was a struggle at one point. Right? The window only works if, if, if a part works. The car only works if it's hooked up to the battery. I couldn't start my car because I blew the main uh, fuse. It's this big. It costs $7. But because that was broken, this little, little connector, tiny little connector in this plastic piece, because that was severed, nothing in my car worked. And the thing is, with the church, if we're not, you can, you can, have, all the, you can have all the parts in the world, but if they're not set up properly, Right? The battery sends power through the main fuse to all sorts of other things. If there is a break in that, it doesn't matter that you have a, I had a brand new battery. My car wouldn't work. And so if we, you can have all the gifts in the world, but if we are not using them for the church, if we are not actually figuring out what's the best way to optimize our collective abilities, we will not get very far. We will stall. And then you know what happens when a car stalls? You don't get where you're trying to go. We have a distinct purpose and vision and direction from God. And how we are organized is important. And those parts need to move. I was trying to replace the crank window on my car because it wouldn't, it wouldn't crank down. And that's problematic when you don't have air conditioning and it's a summer car. And so I went to fix it. It's actually a really simple thing. You pull off the door panel that's held on by a bunch of clips uh, you unscrew like the one door handle and then it's like five bolts. There's like one bolt there, one bolt there, two bolts underneath and another bolt here. You unbolt it, you pull out the whole thing, it's like a whole track, you put the new one in, bolt, 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 bam, you're done. And I'm simplifying. Um, but it took me really, really long. Why? Because one of the bolts, just one, at the bottom right there, decided that it wasn't going to move for me. And I was trying to go, and you know, and, you're, and, you're, and you, try and you try and butter it up, you know, you put that penetrating oil or that, or that WD-40, and you know, you try and heat it up a little bit, you warm it up a little bit, you try and do all these things, but that bolt would not budge, and it was so frustrated, and halfway through, I had to, you know, stop myself and have, like, a little prayer session, just not even for the bolt, just for my own, like, 
emotions, and eventually I, I got it off by completely breaking it off. Um, luckily, you know, there were five other bolts. But this concept is, is that I was trying to get this thing to work so that I could roll down my window. There was a purpose why I was changing this. There was a purpose why I was doing this, and it would, that bolt would not move for me. And so what happens is sometimes God has a purpose for your life, and he has this, and there's been options, and people have asked you to do something, and you're gifted in that area, and it doesn't matter because if you don't move, nothing changes. We are called to move. Not all of us move the same way, right? For those of you who feel like it, put your hand out and look at your palm, right? Now wiggle your fingers. What I learned what is interesting is there's no muscles in your hand, right? There's some tendons. All the muscles that control your fingers are in your forearm. That's why if you take your forearm and you squeeze it, it'll actually kind of pull your hand in a little bit, right? Now take that same arm, right? Take that same arm and make a fist, and now pull your, your arm in, right? When you guys do that, you realize that your bicep has to contract and your tricep needs to, you know, extend. If your tricep is extending while you're trying to do that, you're probably cramping and it usually hurts a lot. I woke up a couple days ago with my foot completely pointed forward because my calf decided that now was the time to get well acquainted with itself. And so the thing is, in order to move, we can't all do the same thing. Right? There is a reason, and that's why you need to organize it. If all of the muscles are like, wait a minute, I'm going to pull, you're not going to get anything done. Right? And so the thing is, that's why it's so important that we don't just participate, but then in order to participate, we also need to, to organize and do things. And sometimes that, that is a struggle because I want to pull, and you want to pull, and you want to pull, and you want to pull, and because I'm the one that should be in charge, or because I'm better at pulling than you, we're all pulling at the same time. The thing with the human body, and with my car, is that if all the body parts decide to go in a different direction at the same time, that's called an explosion. And your body is not going anywhere, and your body has died. If my car's parts go all, like if my wheel goes over there while I'm driving, that is bad. We need to work together. And so the question is, how do you do that? And I don't have a 10-step plan, um, and some of you are like, oh, thank goodness, because it's like 1245. But I just want us to get, we're going to talk about service, and we're going to keep this going kind of throughout, you know, the next little bit leading into camp meeting. But I want to start with the very basis of understanding our organization. And for that, I want to turn to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4 to 14 and 15. Going on the same thing, how, how do we get our car to take us where we need to go? Right? How do we get that, that bus to pick up all those other people and carry them into the kingdom? And one of the first things you have to do is you have to submit to the mechanic. As the parts in that thing, we have to let the mechanic choose where we go and we have to get, sometimes take our, our ego and stuff out of the way. This is hard, right? This is hard because if you think about it, Satan's whole issue that started all of this was, I want to be God. Why do I have to listen to him? And so many times our sin is not based on, you know, other stuff. It's I want to do this, right? I want to be the boss in my life. But the problem is if all the parts in the car decide, start telling the mechanic what to do, the car never moves, Ephesians 4, verse 14 and 15. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, verse 15, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. You can have the world's nicest muscles. You can have the best genetics and proportions and skin tone and jaw structure, but if, no, wait, not jaw structure because I'm going in a different direction. You can have the best like bone structure, but if your body does not have a head, all of that is useless. If my brain cannot send the message to my hand and my hand does not listen to what my brain is telling it, I'm not going to pick something up. 
right? And so the first thing when it comes to church organization, yes, we have hierarchies, yes, we have all of these things, and it's great, but it has to start with us realizing who runs this church. And it's not me, it's not Pastor Godso, it's not any ministry leader, it's not, you know, the dear elder that's been here for, you know, since before we had this building. It is Jesus, right? And what happens is, when we truly accept that in our lives, we say, you know what, Jesus, you're the mechanic, I'm just a part, right? You're the potter, I'm the clay. You're the head, I'm the body extremity. When we accept that and we submit to him, what happens is he can then put us in the right place. And if it is God who is organizing our church, then it is God who is going to take us to amazing heights. And the thing is, you know, as we're getting, we're going to get ready to sing our closing hymn, and, you know, and I picked Jesus, paid it all, because the idea is this. We can only live and move and have our being. We can only reach the world because of what Jesus has done for us. And sometimes we think there's all these things we have to do. There's all this thing. Jesus has already done it. Jesus has already paid for the world. There is no cost to us. All we have to do is go get it. And so I encourage us as we continue, um, you know, here at Willowdale, as you continue in your homes, in your communities, in your work, purpose in your heart to follow God. Decide that you are going to allow him to choose where you go and watch him organize our church. All of us that are stressed out about how are we going to get this done and how are we going to do this, if as a body we submit to the head in Jesus Christ, it will be, we will be amazed at the things we can accomplish through that.